Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us today in person and online for another thought-provoking session at this year's global conference. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce this global humanitarian overview, where we'll have the privilege of hearing from three distinguished leaders. Each of these pioneering leaders are humanitarians and trailblazers in their own right. They bring to bear unrivaled experience and compassion to their work, dedicating so much of their lives to alleviating poverty and hunger and advancing equality, helping the most vulnerable in society, particularly women and children. Their collective work couldn't be more important today. According to the United Nations, nearly 300 million people around the world will need humanitarian assistance and relief due to conflicts, climate emergencies, natural disasters, economic instability, and other factors. Through the discussions during this session, the first with Her Majesty Queen Rania al-Abdullah of Jordan, moderated by MSNBC's Ali Veshi, and the second was Cindy McCain and Ann Veneman, moderated by Nick Kristof of the New York Times. Our hope is that we will leave this conference taking away collectively what we've learned, finding common ground, and working together to forge solutions that will shape a shared future and a better world. So without further ado, please welcome our first speaker to the podium, Her Majesty Queen Rania al-Abdullah of Jordan, and Ali Bachi from MSNBC. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, and Your Majesty, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, I think those words with which we were introduced are, are completely right. I think there is a desperation in our world to find some common ground and to, and to find solutions to some of the most pressing problems we've got. And I want to talk about some of the work that you've done uh, uh, around the issue, around humanitarian issues, and some of the things that are going on. However, uh, His Majesty uh, the King is with the President this afternoon, and I don't know if you guys text or anything, but if, if, uh, if there's any news, could you let us know? Because we're, sure will. We're, we're staying on top of things. Well, th thank you, first of all, Ali, for the introduction, and thank you for everyone for choosing to, to be here today. I think um, this conversation comes at a time that is extremely crucial for us to have. Um, as you know, the last seven months have been traumatic and, and really heartbreaking for everybody, not least of all the people on the ground who are facing danger day after day after day. But I think the danger that is equally important that we need to think about is what this conflict has done to the rest of the world. And um, what we're seeing is that it has revealed uh, and exposed old fractures, it has deepened divisions, and it has divided people along new battle lines. And I think that that is a very dangerous situation because one of the most dangerous features of our world today is polarization. Polarization leads to binary thinking. It makes us think of our world as us versus them, left versus right, east versus west. And even though that kind of might give us a false sense of security that we belong in a certain camp, but it actually inadvertently really puts constraints on us because it kind of limits the way we think, what we should do, what we should say. And more importantly, it makes us look at everybody outside our camp as the rival, as right. the enemy, somebody you can erase, somebody you can dismiss. And actually studies have shown that as humans, we are instinctively more uh, likely to be attuned to the suffering of people who are like us. And that kind of selective empathy is actually quite, has real, uh, terrible actually, real, uh, real life consequences because it affects where we look and what we see. Yeah. And this is happening in this conflict. People are feeling so emotional about it. People are in either this camp or that camp. And I've seen the middle ground sort of shrink year after year after year. And, you know, when it comes to the Palestinians, I think they've been pushed to the periphery where their suffering has become almost unnoticed and where they become almost a people unto whom anything can happen without consequence. And that's why it's important for us to actually find that middle ground, to find that third way. It's so dangerous when we reduce people to just you know, a nationality or a skin color or political views because as human beings, we're so much more complex than that. And so I think what I want to say at the outset is that 
I don't want, I'm not here to try to change anybody's mind. Mm -hmm. But if there's anything I want to achieve is for people to come out of this uh, thinking that there is more to this issue, that it is actually complex and that it needs to be approached with a lot of nuance. And for us to try to find the third way. It's neither, it doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to be either pro-Israel, pro-Palestine. There needs to be a middle ground. And I think one thing that we can start off as a middle ground is maybe agree on three things. First of all, that the current status quo is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable for Palestinians or for Israelis. Second, that peace cannot be achieved through violence, through wars, through weapons. It has to be achieved through negotiations, political process, even handedness and commitment. And the third thing that we need to remember is that the majority of people who are suffering from this conflict on both sides are just ordinary people mm -hmm. who want the same things that we all want, to just live in safety with the people that we love, uh, for our children to have access to health care, education, to a better future. And I think it's important to keep that in mind because that will frame every, the way that we think about this whole thing. With regard to, to, my, to my husband, I think, you know, uh, we are now looking at a possible uh, ceasefire. Um, we are hopeful, I wouldn't say optimistic. As you know, Hamas have um, accepted the terms of the last agreement. Now the Prime Minister's office is looking, the Israeli Prime Minister's office is looking into it and we'll, we'll come back. The main sticking points were uh, Hamas wanted a permanent ceasefire. Uh, Israel said it didn't want one. But uh, then Hamas agreed to having the permanent ceasefire in the second phase of the negotiations. And so now we're going to see what happens. All the while, though, this morning, as you know, uh, there were flyers sent into Rafah asking, Eastern Rafah asking 100,000 Palestinians to evacuate. And the world, as you know, has been trying to warn Israel not to go into Rafah. Uh, you have 1.4 million Palestinians sheltering there. It's a very small area, 50,000 people per square mile, which, and Israel did, the army did say they were going to be using extreme force. So I can't see how that operation will happen without large number of civilian deaths. And this is something we want to try to avoid. So let's, let's uh, set this in the context of, of you. Uh, your country uh, has a, a, a very, very large population of people who uh, think of themselves as of Palestinian origin. Your family is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Jordan has had uh, a peaceful relationship uh, and a fairly functional relationship with Israel for some time. Mm -hmm. So to some degree, you've seen the model of how it can work. Mm -hmm. Given how extreme and how polarized we are now, mm -hmm. is your sense of a future for uh, an Israeli people and a Palestinian people that is safe and secure, are we farther away from it or could it actually happen? Well, if you ask most people, they roll their eyes and they'll say, you know, the two-state solution is dead, that this conflict is intractable. And it is probably the most intractable uh, conflict of our era, but it's because, not because we don't know what needs to be done, but because there's been a lack of seriousness and commitment and political will to get it done. And the approach hasn't been the most productive kind of approach. So for those people who say, you know, it can't be done, I'll say, well, again, point one, the status quo is not sustainable. Right. So what is the alternative? Is the alternative uh, an endless occupation? Um, how will Israel continue to manage that? Will they continue just to use security measures? If that's the case, then any time there's a peace in Israel, then that's just going to be the lull, it's going to be the calm before the storm until the next cycle of violence happens. Is it going to be a one-state solution? But then what does that look like? Does that become like a, an apartheid state? Is it that we're going to send, um, you know, let them go to, to, to Jordan, let them go to Egypt? That is actually, you know, Jordan has said before that we reject any attempts to transfer uh, the population of, uh, of Palestine and to drive them away from their homes or their, or their land. And another wave of refugees will, will actually be amount to another Nakba, which the Arab world does not w want to see. And I, people need to understand when they say, why don't you take them, which is something that we hear quite often. They need to understand what they're asking for. The forcible transfer of an occupied population is a war crime. And we don't want to be participants in that. Uh, it is called ethnic cleansing. And 
and, and Palestinians do not want to uh, be part of Jordan or Jordan to be part of Palestine. So that option is not on the table. So is it endless occupation? What is it? The only way is for a two-state solution. Uh, but we need to look at what we did in the past and, and try to understand why we failed. And part of it is that, you know, we need to understand that it cannot be done by the Palestinians, Israelis alone. And the US plays a very important role because it is the single most powerful country in terms of its leverage on Israel. And uh, it, so it, it depends how much the US is willing to use its political capital to, uh, to hold Israel accountable. Now, in the past, what used to happen is in negotiations, they used to always start off by on the premise of what will Israel accept to do? What are the terms that it will agree on? Not what is required from Israel to do at the bare minimum as dictated by international law. So, so the starting point needs to be a legal framework that is recognized by the international community. And then a commitment from the US to hold Israel accountable when it doesn't stick to the terms, of course, as, the, as well as the Palestinians. Now, you know, a lot of people would, would see what I'm saying as, you know, but the US is Israel's strongest ally. I am not asking for the US to turn against Israel. Uh, 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 but you, to be a good ally, you call your ally out when they're not doing the right thing. Being a good ally doesn't mean you just sign off on anything and everything your friend does. Um, and if I was the United States today, and I was looking at what's happening in, in Israel, a country that I care about, and that's my ally, I would be saying, like, whatever, is, is this war making Israel safer? And whatever um, Israel achieves in terms of short-term tactical gains against Hamas, aren't they coming at a very heavy long-term cost towards Israel's security? Isn't it coming at a heavy cost in terms of the reputational damage that has happened to Israel? The image that has happened, the way that it's distanced Israel from many of its allies? And so, and there, is this war the best way to achieve Israel's long-term security? As the United States, am I gonna prioritize the political agenda and survival of one man, the Prime Minister, and the uh, ideological, uh, uh, ultra-nationalist, religious uh, far right that exists in his cabinet, am I gonna be prioritizing their agenda over the long-term safety and security of the State of Israel? And so sometimes, you know, holding Israel accountable is actually in the best interest of the people of Israel and their long-term uh, interest. And so, again, you know, it is not just about trying to persuade Israel to do the right thing. It is about actually there needs to be consequences when one side of the uh, negotiations, uh, negotiating uh, parties are not sticking to the terms of the negotiation. So I do believe that the only way that uh, we can achieve security in our part of the world is through a negotiated peace where Palestinians ha have not a promise of statehood, but an actual statehood. They can't be given just a, a package of a patchwork of an emasculated state without any symbols of sovereignty. They need to have control over their own lives, self-determination, autom autonomy. Uh, they've been living under occupation, oppression, and dispossession for too long. And when we look at whose fault it is in this cycle or that cycle, we can keep going back and forth, but it all comes back down to an illegal occupation. You want safety and security, we need to end the occupation because you cannot have a safe and secure Israel while there is a grave injustice on their border. So Israel has understood for about a year and a half or almost two that they've got an, a, a grave internal political problem and there have been uh, remarkable protests on the street of Israel uh, predating October 7th. The, for the Palestinians to achieve self-determination is a highly complex ordeal. Mm -hmm. uh, in the West Bank, they've got the Palestinian Authority, which a lot of Palestinians are, are, are um, uh, you know, they're, they're discouraged about because they sometimes think that the Palestinian Authority is the, is the security enforcement arm of the Israeli government. In, in Gaza, there are great complexities. Most of the population of Gaza did not vote for Hamas, mm -hmm. were not around when Hamas took power. So 
achieving that self-determination, we understand it intellectually, people should be able to vote for their leaders and choose their leaders. Mm -hmm. How does it actually go down in, in Israel, in, in Gaza, and in Palestine? Well, or the West Bank. Yes, when we look at the Palestinian Authority, um, part of the reason why they're so unpopular is because obviously mistakes of their own, bureaucracy, other issues that they have, and the Palestinians themselves are the first to demand a complete uh, reformation of and structural uh, reforms within the, um, within the Palestinian Authority. But part of the reason why they are so weak is because they've been very ineffective. And this is not me saying it, this is um, Prime Minister himself admitting that his policy was to divide and conquer, to, to prop Hamas up in order to undermine the Palestinian Authority and then say there is no partner for peace. And so the Palestinian Authority was brought in on a mandate of a nego achieving a negotiated peace uh, since Oslo. And at the beginning, people were optimistic. The, among the Palestinians, the approval ratings for peace uh, through Oslo was in the 90% above. And, but year after year, the Palestinian Authority was unable to deliver to the people. And their reality just looked worse and worse and worse. And that means that increasing number of settlements, increasing number of checkpoints, less freedoms, more persecution, more, more military raids. So they're, consistently their lives were getting worse. And therefore, they looked at the Palestinian Authority and they're like, you're not delivering to us. Now, anybody you bring in, even if the Palestinian Authority was to do a complete reformation, even if you bring the most professional, qualified, talented people, if they are not empowered, if they're not able to deliver to the Palestinian people, then they will not be strong either. So it's not so much just about what do you do with the Palestinian Authority. It is what is the vision for a just and comprehensive peace that includes West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. What is the vision for that? And will we actually commit to it as an international community and ensure that it succeeds? Again. Uh, there's a lot of um, narrative, the prevailing narrative is that Palestinians were offered peace time and again, uh, but they walked away. The Israelis made concessions, but the Palestinians always want to choose the, the, the road of violence. That is an inaccurate assessment. And um, um, the Palestinians did make concessions, they accepted Israel as a full-fledged state. But we need to see that we should judge based on not just what Israel says, but what it does. So for the longest time, it was talking peace, but it was creating a reality that made a viable, contiguous Palestinian state almost impossible. Settlement building, settlements are considered illegal. They are universally condemned by the international community, and yet they're still going on. And as Israel is fighting this war in Gaza with Hamas, we are seeing things happening in the West Bank, where, which is governed by the, not Hamas, but by the Palestinian Authority. And for example, in March, we saw the largest land grab in 30 years, where they confiscated 80 hectares of land to build a new settlement. And so these settlements, there's just no way under international law, morally, or in any way possible to justify their existence. And what they create is a very warped reality, because in the West Bank and in other areas where there are settler, settlements, you have people living within the same geographic area, but living completely different realities. The Palestinians are governed by military law, whereas the Israeli settlers go enjoy their full rights under civil, civil law. Uh, uh, Palestinians cannot enter into, uh, into Israel without permit. They, uh, they, any movement within the territories or outside are limited by demeaning checkpoints, routine delays, and, 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 and searches and humiliations, whereas the Israelis can get in superhighways and just drive into Israel proper and come back. Um, um, Palestinians are not allowed to, they don't have their uh, uh, political freedoms or right to demonstrate because they are governed by harsh military laws, whereas Israelis enjoy their full rights. So what you have is one state, Israel, applying a two-tiered system where Palestinians are still subjugated behind walls uh, and, and you know, they have one set of rules and, and, and laws governing their lives and Israelis having another. And I know that Israelis get very angry when you use words like apartheid. 
And for me, it doesn't matter what word you use. I don't care about the semantics. I care about the reality of it. What would you call it? You know? The other thing that I find very strange is a lot of times, you know, we hear that in the people, the large number of civilians who were killed in Gaza was due to Hamas using them as human shields, which in and of itself is not a very convincing argument because Gaza is one of the most densely populated places in the world. So any place that Hamas is going to be in by default is going to be surrounded by uh, by civilians. And we know that in this highly densely populated area, they used an unprecedented number of massive, that's 2,000 pound bombs, and unguided bombs. So how is it that civilians are gonna... But more importantly to me, if the definition of uh, human shields is putting civilians in harm's way in order to protect yourself, then isn't uh, you know, the, the government's uh, policy in Israel is to give grants, subsidies, and tax breaks for Israelis to go and live in settlements. Isn't that the ultimate human shield? When you're asking your own civilians, to, if th the argument of Israel is that we can't give Palestinians a state because that would be a security threat to us. If a Palestinian state is, a, is indeed a security threat, then why are you encouraging, actively encouraging your citizens to go and live among the Palestinians? and in, in illegal settlements. So, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. What do people, we have a very influential audience here. Um, these, these are uh, philanthropists, business leaders, and investors. If someone wants to make this, the outcome of this better, mm -hmm. what can people do? Because we see this playing out on the international stage and it, it makes people feel impotent. There are these prevailing narratives which you have, uh, have discussed with us. What should influential Americans I do I think about it's, this? Not, it's to just not think of just the narratives. You know, I saw this uh, video recently of um, Mitt Rom Senator Mitt Romney asking uh, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Tony Blinken, about how, how did Israel get the PR wrong this time? And I was struck by the question because I think the failure here is not about PR. It's not about how Israel is spinning the story. It's the problem with the story itself. The narrative cannot be so divorced from reality. You cannot continue to create a reality on the ground, but then sell a completely different narrative. Just like I said now, human shields. Well, look. On the ground, 70% 70, 70 of the casualties are civilians. It's killed more doctors in this war, more doctors, more aid workers, than any, journalists, than any other uh, conflict. It's killed 14,500 kids. So that doesn't make sense. When you say Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, well, how could a democracy be depriving an entire population of their human rights? You know, um, When you say IDF is the most moral army in the world, well, how is that true when veteran Israeli soldiers are saying that what we're doing is wrong and when, the, when a lawyer from the army comes and says, you know, the behavior is cross, crossing the criminal threshold. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not just about the narrative. It is about the reality itself. And as I said before, I don't care what we call it. You know, you want to call it genocide, you don't want to call it genocide. It's a lot of people dying, and the fact that we're debating whether it is, that's shocking in and of itself, you know? Uh, so, so I think what I want people to do is to not just think of a narrative, not, not just say, you know, this is the hero, and this is the villain, to try to simplify it in that way. There's a lot more to it, and, and I think we all need to rally behind a third way that actually puts the people first beyond the political agendas of leaders or zealots or extremists. So this is an interesting point because we have pushed hard, hearts have heartened since October 7th. There's no question. So much. Um, and, and you have often brought out, not in just, just this context, but in other contexts, 
that we are in a world that is polarized and we are pushing people toward the extremes. We are pushing people who might be in that moderate middle, including in Israel and, and, and uh, the, the occupied territory and Gaza. There are fewer people who believe mm -hmm. in a two-state solution in your part of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we still talk about it like it's a viable thing that if the United States fully gets behind, it can happen. Mm -hmm. But we also have a narrative that people are either pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian, which I was not certain mm -hmm. needed to be the case. I think one can believe in the determination. I think people should put people first. You know, we, in, what we're demanding, what Palestinians want is not, not sympathy or, or special treatment. They just want the impartial application of the law. You know, uh, what, what people are asking is, you know, yes, there was outrage on October 7th and, and that there should be, but why isn't there outrage about the number of people who are being killed now? You know, why is it okay for some people to have human rights where others are deprived of them? So, and this is something that's actually putting the U.S. in a tight spot because there are some contradictions in the U.S. position. You, you have to give human life equal value and you have to place equal condemnation on human rights violations. You cannot have credibility without moral consistency. And that's what we're seeing here, is a, is a, is a global community that is not applying the same standards on different populations. And that's causing a lot of people in my part of the world to feel completely disillusioned and to actually lose faith in, in, the, in the global system where they feel it's not just towards them. So, so I mean, I just encourage people to, to try to, to, to challenge themselves. I challenge myself every day. I, I, I don't want to be biased because I know because of my background I'm going to sympathize with one side more. So I try every day to put myself in the shoes of somebody on the other side. Yeah. And I try to, to, to also you know, look beyond the noise. You know, people are trying to conflate anti-Israel criticism with uh, anti-Semitism. That is so dangerous. The vast majority of the Jewish people are peace-loving people, and many of them are appalled at what they're seeing. You can't pe put people in, in one basket. Uh, so, so I think it's just looking beyond the narrative of really trying to understand what is behind this. But those and folks who, uh, who, who mess this up are those who have been pushed to extremes, uh, anti-Semites who will join pro-Palestinian rallies who are not helping the, the argument and on the, in some of these counter protests as you saw in this city, um, you know, remarkable violence that doesn't, it, it, it doesn't help the dialogue on any front. We're, we're going to have to get back to a point where we, you might empathize more with one side than the other, but you're going to have to have some empathy for everybody. Absolutely, and you know, like um, uh, a Palestinian uh, thinker said, uh, Edward Said, he said, just to paraphrase him, that the reality that we're in, the situation that we're in now is not inevitable. It is a result of choices, historic choices made by men and women. It is man-made and it can be remade. And I think for us who feel that this is an impossible uh, problem to solve, it is solvable. It is, it's just about, like you said, for us to not just judge the other side as the enemy, but to really try to find the common ground. And the common ground is that we want the same things. And sometimes the things that we want are not the sa same things that our leaders want. And certainly in this situation, I think, not that they see it this way right now, because obviously the population in Israel are afraid, they feel traumatized, and they've been taught by their leaders that Palestinians are not people like us. Um, they are just you know, security th threats that we have to defend ourselves against. And that is not doing them justice because ultimately, you know, there's not gonna be long-term security. Nothing can save, safeguard Israel and its long-term security as much as a peace can. Um, and so there needs to be a re-education, a re-humanization between the two people. For the time being, I believe that can only be two states and two people living in separateness until they can start to heal and, and, uh, the wounds and to try to build the trust that has been lost now as a result of years of suffering. Um, and we have a responsibility to, to try to, to stand behind a vision uh, that, sees, that delivers the people there the security and the, and the future they deserve. The timer says zero. I think they're lying to me because I can't believe we've been talking for half an hour. Um, uh, we're grateful to you. 
for, uh, for your continued efforts to try and find humanitarian solutions to the, the suffering that so many people are going through, but for coming and having a frank conversation with us uh, from your remarkable perspective. So we appreciate it. Her Majesty Queen Rania.